all for coming. Um, uh, some people I don't know, and some people I do, and I want to thank the committee members, uh, especially for helping me and Ron get to this point. Uh, our team, so yes. George and Lisa, thank you so much for um, pushing us, getting us here. And uh, Ron today is going to share with us everything he's been working on and everything he's learned and in the process teach us something new. Unless all of you are already microbial experts and turtle experts and uh, glyphosate experts and metagenomic experts, you're going to learn something new. <coughs> now the title is A Mouthful. And he gave a dress rehearsal yesterday to my green biology lab class. And they were like, this <laughs> uh, and thought it was too long. I'm not even going to try and say it. At the end of this talk, if you come up with a better title, um, today is an exploration of uh, all the way driving to our sleep. So, exploration <laughs> of the inner microbial world of charismatic megafauna. <laughs> the shortest one I came up was of microbes and C Midas. We have a happy audience now. That's good. So with great pride, um, I would like to turn the table over to my graduate student, Ron Kim. Woo! Thank you all for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the identification of the gastrointestinal microflora of the green turtle, Colonium mitis, and the impacts of glyphosate herbicide on these my, uh, the back here. Throughout this talk, I may refer to we because so many people have been a part of this project. I couldn't have done this alone. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody um, for their support throughout these three years of doing this. Colonial mitis is the largest marine herbivore in Hawaii, and it. In the early stages, it's known to be omnivorous. And as adults, it shifts to a sole herbivore diet. And in white, it's known to consume over 300 species of macroalgal and seagrass. It can opportunistically consume a terrestrial grass, and it's protected under the Endangered Species Act. The green turtle utilizes a hindgut fermentation. So this is where it relies on microbes to digest the plant material. Digestion primarily occurs in the large intestine and cecum. Some of you know that horses, horses also have a hindgut fermentation system. There are little studies done on the microbial community in green turtles. A lot of the studies have done cloacal swabs, which a cloaca is just a shared opening with the ur urinary system, the reproductive system, and the intestinal system. Only one study has looked at fecal and cloacal swabs of juvenile colonia minus, and none have sampled in situ to identify the gastrointestinal microflora. I suspect that the micro microbial gut communities in herbivores, the dominant uh, bacteria are Bacteroides, Lostridiales, Rubionales, and very, very few microbiales. In omnivores, this primarily consists of B. sulfro, Vibrianales, and Aramandales. And these studies have been done on marine iguanas, um, herbivorous fish, manatees, etc. And also omnivorous 
uh, marine fish. So the objective of this study, first off, is to identify the digestive microflora in the green turtle. Eight turtles were served as donors for this project that were euthanized. Eight turtles spanning throughout the Hawaiian Islands and the necropsies were performed at Ford Island in Oahu. Five locations were sampled. The crop, which is an opening right after the esophagus, but before the stomach. The stomach, small intestine, the cecum, the large intestine. Cultures were swabbed and streaked on nutrient honor and various differential and selective media. In addition, the microflora were gram stained and grown in anaerobic and aerobic conditions, so without oxygen and in the presence of oxygen. After plating for 24 hours, we see a high diverse amount of microflora. So we have, for example, we have pink colonies, orange colonies, etc. And so what I did is I restrict them and restrict them to try to obtain as pure culture as possible. After obtaining pure cultures, one of the assays is the interoplary test kit, which is a 12 well biochemical system, and it's used for gram-negative and oxidase-negative bacteria. You inoculate and incubate for 30, uh, 36 degrees Celsius for 18 to 24 hours. To help you visualize it, we have the control on the bottom and three uh, isolates on the top. The control for glucose production is a reddish color. And when it is positive, it turns a yellow. And so different um, colors indicate a positive or negative reaction. And this helps identify the isolates. Using these methods of differential and selective media and the interoplary kit, I obtained 13 isolates, primarily are aerobic microflora. So this may not necessarily be the digestive microflora that I'm looking for. With the, with the highest diversity in the small intestine and the lowest diversity in the large intestine. Which makes sense because the large intestine should be, if there's digestive bacteria, it should be primarily anaerobic. This is why I'm shifting using 16S rDNA metagenomics. So this is sequencing an environmental sample, in this case, the contents in the gastrointestinal tract. Because culturing microflora and simulating the gut is really hard. And you can't simulate this um, environment. So you lose over 90% of the microflora. And so this is where genetics comes in. This allows for the identification of the unculturable microbes and can be allowed for comparison. Two turtles, one turtle had no tumors and the second turtle had um, turtles, uh, had tumors and they were sequence in three regions, the cecum and large intestine where primarily the digestion occurs, and then the cloacal for comparison to other studies. DNA extraction was used using a chiogen stool kit. The ION16S metagenomics kit was used for pooled primers, and this allows for the hypervariable regions in the bacterial genome to be used. 
and purification is checked using a DNA high sensitivity <coughs> kit in the bioanalyzer. And samples were barcoded to identify unique samples. And optimal concentration for the library was used using qPCR, the quant quantification kit. Afterwards, all the samples were pulled together and the barcodes allow to differentiate between the regions before um, loading it into the sequencer. Samples were sequenced using the ION personal genome machine or the ION PGM. Quality check was used for the HiQ View OT2 and sequenced on a 318 chip. Afterwards, the software removed any polyclonal or low quality or adapter dimer reads. And we obtained a total of four and a half million reads. These sequences were analyzed using the ION Reporter software and low abundance less than 10 reads were removed, and any sequences less than 150 base pairs. The genus was defined at 97% similarity. A species was defined at 99% similarity. And these sequences were compared to the curated green genes database. For the first term and the sequence, I'm gonna walk you guys through. On the left in red, we primarily see the phylum from acutes dominated with about 50%. And this is also primarily dominated by the order Clostridiales, which is what we would expect for marine herbivores. In addition, we have Echeroidetes, which is about 45% abundance in these reefs for this sample, which is again exactly what I would expect to see. To zoom in, of the Bacteroid dailies, we have about 70% in the Bacteroid Daisy uh, family. In the clustered dailies, uh, we see Dominant lacnose fiber ACA, cluster DACA, and ruminococcus DACA, which is again indicating of other marine herbivore studies. So this is great news. Um, in the large intestine, we do see a shift of more firmicutes and bacteroid DVs, similar. But when we get to the cloaca, it's primarily dominated about three quarters of the sequences are firmicutes. And then we also see about 4% of the d sulfovibrium nasea, which is indicating um, sequences of omnivore. Just to give you guys Low, you can see the progression of more dominant from acuities as we go down from starting from the cecum all the way to the large intestine and then back down in the cloaca. For the second turtle, we see about 70% of from acuities and no real obvious change when it goes to the large intestine. But then when we get to the cloaca again, we see more of the bacteroidetes phyla, and we also see the presence of unmapped sequences and more of the D-sulfovibrionales in the cloaca. And then once again, the progression for the phyla dominant. All samples were dominated by two 
main phylum, Hermicutes and Bacteroidetes, with three families, Clustered in Aceae, Ruminococcaceae, and Lachnospiraceae, for Hermicutes. And under the families for Bacteroidetes, we have Porphyromonium, Daceae, and Bacteroidetes. That's the dominant for all sectors. A small percentage of breeds do indicate characteristic bacteria omnivores. And all cycles were dominated by microflora that are consistent with marine herbivores. And bacterial composition varied along the GI tract and between the turtles. And enumeration and identification of green turtle microflora would help clarify um, connections between diet and the gut microbes. And this could also be used as new tools to assess the health of the turtle. Um, there have been studies of humans looking at gut bacteria as indicators for overall health. In some foraging areas in the Hawaiian Islands, green turtles are growing at a reduced rate. Glyphosate based herbicides are also being sprayed to combat weeds and are frequently sprayed affecting non-targeted organisms. Glyphosate is also known to be toxic to plants, fungi, and bacteria, and no studies have been assessed to determine the toxicity to green turtle gut microflora. Glyphosate in Hawaii is sprayed year-round, sold commonly as Roundup, as many of you might know. In these areas, it is prone to heavy rainfall, flash floods, and runoff. And glyphosate can make its way into the marine environment through these ways. Very little is known about glyphosate in the marine environment. The half-life, depending on light and temperature conditions, can range between 47 and 310 days. Glyphosate is also measurable in its metabolites in the marine environment. This pathway, the uh, Shikimatsu pathway, leads to the production of aromatic amino acids. But in the presence of glyphosate, this pathway cannot persist. Glyphosate is also known to be toxic to macroalgal and seagrass species that the green turtle may consume. Glyphosate is also lead, uh, can lead to reduction in nutrient quality of plants. In cattle, Research has suggested that glyphosate is toxic and causes a less efficient digestion. In chickens, who also have high gut fermentation, beneficial microflora in the gut are known to be more susceptible than pathogenic microflora. So I hypothesized that different taxa of bacteria are um, that have different sensitivities to glyphosate, and the inhibition of bacteria will be dependent on the glyphosate concentration. The first assay I did was the Kirby Bauer distribution assay, and four isolates were exposed to 15 concentrations of glyphosate and exposed to a control. So in this picture, we have the control in the center, and we have three discs that have been soaked with various concentrations of glyphosate, and I measured the zone of growth inhibition in diameter. For the first isolate, Pantheoe, I have glyphosate concentration on the x-axis and zone of growth inhibition on the y. Shared letters to note no significant <coughs> difference. And so we find that as glyphosate concentration increase, the 
zone of growth inhibition increases. And yeah, this concentration of 1.76 times 10 to the negative third, we find a significant difference in growth inhibition than the control. <coughs> With Shigella, we see a similar but more pronounced response. But the concentration at which it's significantly different from the control is at 2.81 times 10 to the negative 2. The third isolate, we have Staphylococcus aureus, which is an opportunistic pathogen. We see a more pronounced but delayed response at 7.03 times 10 to the negative 3. Um, grams per liter of glycosy, but we have at higher concentrations it's more effective. Proteus, however, it has, it's not as sensitive. It only takes 0.225 grams per liter to be significant to the control. So there is a significant response to glyphosate observed in all taxa at concentrations greater than 0.225 grams per liter glyphosate. The second method I used is an optical density assay where aliquots of a mixed microbial community were exposed to six concentrations of glyphosate with the control of the DI water. And absorbance was measured at 600 nanometers before and after uh, exposure. 600 nanometers was chosen because it's the least interference with the nutrient broth. To help you visualize, with a spectrophotometer in a highly dense microbial community, light would penetrate and there would be low transmittance if there's more bacteria. In cultures that have less bacteria, there would be high transmittance, so light would pass through easier. So we have transmittance at 600 nanometers on the y-axis in glyphosate concentration on the X. As concentrations increase, we do see a significant difference at 2.2 times 10 to the negative 4. So in the mixed bacteria communities, we do see um, a significant difference in the microbial density than the control at concentrations greater than 2.2 times 10 to the negative fourth grams per liter. Glyphosate has a negative effect on not only individual taxa, but as a community, as a whole, and effects of reduced microbial growth on digestion efficiency is unknown, and effects of long-term exposure of green turtles gut microflora is to glyphosate is unknown. So diverse bacterial taxa occur throughout the green turtle, GI tract, and dominant microflora are firmicutes and bacteroidetes, which are consistent with other marine herbivore studies. Glyphosate has a negative effect on individual GI tract bacterial taxa, and also as a mixed community. And long-term conservation of green turtles may depend on their microflora, and more studies should be done. Sure. The 
was that just showing the species richness in terms of how many are there, or are you looking at the concentrations of, of a given species? So it's overall abundance of the reeds. So the pie charts, I'll give you an example. So, stay for now. We have, it's an overall abundance of all the reads for that um, sample. So, the, everything in that sample was barcoded to a unique signature that the software reads. And this tells overall abundance of the expected taxa. Now, in these primers, we do see a lot of um, family level only. So, so you, you found twenty nine percent that were correct. Um, that were that could only be identified to this family only. Whereas others, depending on, um, like that one, the Latinos pyrisi, it got all the way to the species level. Okay, so that's the actual abundance of bacteria. Correct. The turtles that you used were using that. What was wrong with them leading up to the mutation? Did that look like anything that you observed in the lab? That's a great question. Um, overall, um, a lot of these turtles are euthanized because they're sick of some reason. They're, um, some of them were euthanized because of tumors, others were just um, really sick. And um, based on the sequences, that is a limitation because they are an endangered species. Um, the perfect sample would be a not sick dead turtle, <laughs> um, which would be like a shark attack or a bow strike. Um, so that is a limitation of this study. But based on these sequences, looking at the data, we don't find that many opportunistic pathogens. Um, from these sequences. So I'm pretty confident that these represent gut microflora in the green term. That's your, your benchmark, that's your gold bar. That I'm glad the question was asked. Are these animals that were so ill that it was being inhumane, inappropriate to keep them alive, are the microflora representative that's mm -hmm. the case you're going to have to make very strongly up front in order to publish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can it be made? Yeah. It's your project. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you take before you started? Really fresh. So they euthanized it and almost immediately, um, as soon as they were cut open, I sampled and they were immediately taken to agar. Um, so that they can be restreaked when I got back to the lab. These were Oh, for the sequence, yes. These were from. I wanted to make the point that uh, all of these turtles were euthanized by Dr. Terry Work of USGS, a certified veterinarian. And uh, Ron flew over to Honolulu and was present within minutes of the. Mm -hmm. The drug euthanasia of the animal and the collection of the samples. So, great credit to Dr. Dr. Work for accommodating you yeah. in this study. Yeah. Uh, were any of the turtles emaciated or um, looked like they had not been feeding the turtles that you chose for euthanization? Yes, some of them. Um, but well, you can put back in your yeah, no, yeah. There are some turtles you didn't take Correct. because you thought they were not feeding. So I, I remember you mentioning you said you um, did molecular characterization of some turtles with and without tumor. Correct. How did those differ? Because you didn't necessarily point out that these had tumor, but these ones still okay. Um, in the microflora that had the tumor. Um, we 
found I found that they had a higher amount of hermit kiwis than um, a relative balance um, of 50 50. Um, for example, Turtle One um, in the beginning, it was about 50 50, whereas in the second turtle, that in the same area, it was about 75%. So that the second one was the one for two minutes. Correct. And then my um, next question for you that was relates to the herbicide was which of the concentrations that she used is typical of what you find in the environment? So even at the lowest um, amount um, of 2.2 times 10 to the 4, like that's one of the magical amounts um, in um, the coastal environment studies with the marine. Um, but I based it, the highest concentration of 3.6 was based off of uh, manufacturer recommended dose to spray um, for weed control. And so I did serial dilutions um, until I got to the lowest. The one that you see the Correct. Pattern. And then, Tim, did you have a question? Okay. How, how relevant is the concentration? To it is the right on the line. Where? And how's the glyphosate going to get into it? Is it something that is being uptaken by the Small enough concentrations not to fill it, but you'd like to move them down, or just by well, what's your thinking? When they forage, they do. We haven't tested for glyphosate in the marine environment, but when the green turtle forages, it opens its mouth. If glyphosate is in the water, it can swallow the contaminated water with that. Um, previous research that I've done has suggested that um, Terracladiella being um, a diet primarily that the green turtle has is one of the most sensitive species um, that I tested. So it could go from eating contaminated limu from the water. Um, I don't necessarily know the answer um, to test it. I would love to test residuals in like of glyphosate with plant matter in the soils and in the water. Uh, my question kind of goes back to the sick versus you know, the tumor turtle or not. Do um, you have some turtles that weren't sick and did not have tumors that were, uh, you know, that died because of those stricter carcasses? And can you use that data to kind of compare the sick turtles to turtles with tumors um, to see? Uh, how the uh, species compare? Um, one of the turtles that I did sequence, Turtle One, mm -hmm. did not have presence of tumors, but it did die for um, an unknown reason um, that hasn't been determined yet. Um, but <coughs> it was sick, it was dead. I would love to sample a boat strike or shark attack turtle. But that happens, correct me if I'm wrong, George, every three years, roughly, but it hasn't happened, to my knowledge, working on this project. We know what killed every one of the turtles in Ron's sample. Uh, Dr. Work killed them. Every one was, every one was perfectly alive, but not perfect. Except, so just to clarify that. And, uh, and uh, uh, one or two a year on the boat strike thing, but the, the speed of being able to get to Honolulu or to bring the journal over here. You know, Dr. McDermott said, oh, Ron's sampling regime. Actually, the turtles dictated the sampling yeah. regime to Ron rather than vice versa. Um, May I say that one of the suggestions early on is that we could have gone, Ron could have gone overseas where there are legal harvests of turtles. Mm -hmm. But the complication, you do that for your PhD name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're at the mercy of what, the, what, what the turtles delivered to Ron during this three year period, two year period. Uh, the exposure to glyphosate and then subsequent potential change in gut flora, is that an acute symptom or is that something that has to be, um, a turtle has to be exposed to for a long period? 
no one knows. There's nobody has really done these studies to make that call. Um, I would love to start doing that, but to analyze glyphosate, it is expensive to analyze. Along that vein, do you think it um, antimicrobial pharmaceuticals in wastewater could have a, a similar action that's easier to test with those chemicals? Maybe. I don't know the answer to that, but hey, with the Department of Health, I'm sure could make it happen. Based on what you know about glyphosate now, having done these studies in our fertile, do you have any uh, management recommendations on the use of that herbicide? Well, I believe there are situations where using herbicides are necessary um, for hardening trees. Maybe not necessarily sprayed around the coastline. Um, in Hawaii, we do have basalt, very porous rocks. That may not be the best choice around um, bodies of water. Um, that would be my recommendation. Or any kind of waterways. Permacuties and bacterial genes or all new words for me. Are they anaerobic or aerobic? They are mostly anaerobic. Okay. Anaerobic. So your uh, plating and things that would never have caught these guys. You had said that there were no previous in situ studies for gut or anything that your unidentified samples. Well, the reference database, um, my sequences are only good as the database. It could be that these, because nobody has done this kind of work, the sequences may be novel. I have to really look into it and maybe compare it to other databases. But in this case, I don't know. I need to analyze it more, but it could be. Remember a part of this being in your project at one point, but could you use the feces of the healthy turtle to determine kind of like a background abundance of lung microbial seeds in the hind Well, there are limitations with that. So with the cloaca, um, the feces comes out in a shared opening. So one of my early studies is doing cloacal swabs and it was really hard to get any kind of fecal sample because um, because of the shared opening. Um, it was it was counterproductive. It would just push it back up. Um, <laughs> um, so, but the mechanism. What did you use? I used lots of things. <laughs> I tried. I tried an enema. I've tried cotton swabs. I think the funniest thing in poor turtle was a, a swine artificial insemination, <laughs> which is corn <laughs> Plastic and soft, and gentle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most interesting one. But to go back to your answer, um, there may be contaminants going out because it's a shared opening and may not really be true digestive bacteria. So in my opinion, the best way is to go directly down. That your answer raises the question. Uh, when you sampled, you listed cloaca in the euthanized animals. So you were entering the cloaca from the, the other side. From the inside. Okay. Right. That's a good thing to Clarify because somebody can sit here confused, including me, about where you got it from. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, so.
Just something to think about and thought about here. I didn't pre-plan any of this on the flight over. Uh, recently, you've seen in the news reports, TV and newspaper, about uh, pollution warnings, high bacterial counts. Mm -hmm. Get out of the water or don't use the water. Kahalu Beach Park was shut down over on the other side. Kilo Bay. Kilo Bay, I didn't know that. Kilo Bay. I, 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 I knew Beach Park and heaven forbid, Wait, you see. You didn't tell people to stay out of the water, they just said bacterial contamination. You may not have an answer now, but if you do, give it. is it possible, based on some of your findings for various bacteria, that this pollution is due to turtles, turtle feces? Oh. I can definitely 